something in the way, something in the way, something in the way, something in the way. Hello there, my name's Richard Bliss and um, I'm doing a talk called What's in a Name? which is about the street names on Pendower Estate. And of course on Pendower, the street names tell us a story about love and power and politics. And there is something in the look you throw me When you throw me that look right through me Cause there is something Today, Pendower's thriving estate, part of the urban landscape of Newcastle. But when the estate was built, Benwell was a rural area with just a few country lanes. By the 1930s, some of the old roads and lanes, like Fox and Hounds Lane and the West Road, had become part of the estate. And new streets had emerged, like Pease Avenue, replacing the southern part of Tubal Lonin. But there's one family whose names dominate the streets of Pendower, and that family is the Shaftos. Throughout the Shafto family tree, we see the name Robert Shafto. But the Robert Shafto we're interested in was the Sheriff of Newcastle in 1607, and he took up residence at Benwell Tower in 1608. Because of the old laws governing marriage, many of the Shafto women have been lost into a slightly murky past of simply being wives and mothers. I want to put that right by talking to you about Isabel Bartram, one of the women of the Shafto family. Isabel had married Cuthbert Shafto of Bavington, and it was Isabel that brought significant wealth into the Shafto family. And for generations, the name of Bertram would appear in the Shafto family tree, keeping alive Isabel's family name. And her family name, in Bertram Crescent, gives a nod to the medieval past that lies beneath the gardens, houses and streets that make up Pendower. Two other Shafto women give us our next two names. This is Dorcas Avenue. And it gives me a chance to talk about Dorcas Shafto. Dorcas was born in 1629, the daughter of the first Robert Shafto of Benwell Tower. Although Dorcas didn't inherit, she did help embed the Shafto family in the heart of political life in Newcastle and Northumberland. Dorcas married Lancelot Fenwick, creating a connection to one of the richest and most powerful families in the North. Dorcas and Lancelot had just one son, Martin, who was born in 1649. Just in case anyone's confused, we're not talking about the Fenix who started the department store on Northumberland Street. We're talking about the Alderman and Freeman Fenix who have influence in Newcastle right back to the 1400s. Now I'm gonna to jump to the top of the estate. So this behind me is Adair Avenue, which is named after Camilla Adair Shafto, who was born in 1756. And she is one of the unlikely heiresses of the Shafto fortunes that came with Benwell Tower and the surrounding Benwell estate. By the middle of the 18th century, Britain had become one of the most powerful nations in the world. America was still a British colony and Britain had established itself as the most powerful trading nation in Europe. In 1756, Camilla Shafto was born and when she was born, it seemed unlikely that she would inherit, having two older brothers, Robert and Jenison. But in a twist of fate and family tragedy, Camilla came to inherit. Jenison, who was a great lover of gambling and horse racing, shot himself in 1771 probably overwhelmed by gambling debts. And 10 years later, Camilla's older brother, Robert, died. Neither Robert or Jenison had children, meaning that when their father died, Camilla became the surviving heiress. 
and took control of Benwell Tower, the mines and the estates, a rare thing for an unmarried woman. It wasn't long before she was being courted by men from some of the most influential families from throughout the country. And three years after inheriting, she agreed to marry William Adair at St John's in Newcastle. On marriage, Camilla became Camilla Adair and hence Adair Avenue. There's an interesting story attached to Camilla and the painter Joshua Reynolds. Reynolds had painted Camilla's father, Robert, as well as other members of the Shafto family. In 1789, Reynolds wrote to Camilla requesting payment for three paintings. One of Jenison Shafto of Ratting, which is in Cambridge. One of Lord Granby and one of Mr Shafto, Camilla's father. It seems like so many of us, the staff in Joshua Reynolds' studio had got a bit mixed up about the different branches of the Shafto family. With all three paintings having Shafto connections, they'd simply parceled them up and shipped them to Camilla. Joshua Reynolds wrote to Camilla from Leicester in 1789. Madam, in looking over my accounts, I find the pictures which I sent you some years since, according to your direction, have not yet been paid for. I am, with great respect, your most obedient humble servant, J. Reynolds. For Mr. Jennison, £18.18. And 18 shillings. For Mr. Shafto, £25.04. And four shillings. For Lord Granby, £25.04. And four shillings. Total, £69.06. And six shillings. However, by this time, Camilla is married and it's her husband, William, who writes back to Joshua Reynolds. Sir, in answer to your letter of the 16th instant addressed to Miss Shafto, now Mrs Adair, I am to inform you that I apprehend there must be some mistake in the statement of your account, as the picture of the late Lord Granby was a present from his Lordship to Mr Jennison Shafto of Ratting and Mr. Jennison's picture was sent by Mrs. Adair when she received it from you to the widow of that gentleman, and at her death, her effects being sold for the satisfaction of her creditors, was taken with some other articles at the valuation set upon it to the appraiser. Mrs. Adair has likewise furnished me with a letter from you of the 21st of May, 1781, at the time you sent the pictures to her, in which the statement of your account is only for the picture of the late Mr Shapto, her father, at 24 guineas, which is the only claim I conceive you can have upon me and for the payment for which I intend to have called upon you last spring when I was in town, but from hurry of business forgot to discharge it. I will therefore direct Mr Weatherby of Newmarket to call upon you for that purpose the first time he is in town, and as I seldom visit London, except when on business requires my attendance. I am, sir, with great respect, your most obedient servant, William Adair. We have two opportunities to talk about Jenison in relation to Benwell. First, Jenison Shafto, a name that appears in the Shafto family tree and a brother of Camilla and Robert. But the other is Ralph Jennison, who was born in 1696 and died in 1758. Jennison lived at Elswick Hall and sat in the House of Commons between 1724 and 1758. And he was High Sheriff of Northumberland in 1716, becoming a freeman of Newcastle in 1718. And Ralph Jennison was connected to Sir Peter Riddell, obviously Riddell being the next street to Jennison. Sir Peter had inherited a share of the family's coal mining interests from um, his family and they were valued at about £300 in 1636. Peter was a well-known local politician and at the time that he was in Parliament there were significant discussions going on about both religion and politics, as Protestant politics was moving into the ascendant. And Peter was supported in his political life by the godly preacher, Robert Jennison, who was a relation of Ralph Jennison's. 
Peter Riddell is perhaps best known for resisting coal levies that were, should have been paid to the Crown. He was involved in a number of bills in Parliament to try and resist that money going down to London to serve the Crown coffers, preferring that it should be retained in Newcastle as a local tax. Of course, Newcastle had been able to levy its own taxes since the 1400s. Auburn Avenue is named after Auburn Surtees, who was a significant banker and merchant in Newcastle. His son, William, had taken up residence at Benwell House, but the name Surtees is perhaps best remembered because of Auburn's daughter, Bessie, who eloped with John Scott, a man who would eventually become Lord Eldon and Chancellor of England. Bessie lived in one of two merchant houses that still remain on the quay side, and they show the considerable wealth of the Surtees family because at the time lead glass was very expensive, and we can see just how much win how many windows there are in these houses. Bessie's father had arranged a marriage for Bessie, and she was to marry a member of the Blackett family. The Blackett Ords, of course, eventually ended up owning the Benwell Estates. But he was 65 and she was only 17 and she was having none of it. She would got her eye on one of the emerging middle class traders, John Scott. And John was trading coal down in the Guildhall, which was just opposite where Bessie was living in her father's house. It's said that she got him to bring a ladder so that she could climb up out of the window. And they did in fact elope to Scotland. And although we see this as being something of a scandal, the truth is that their marriage was actually solemnised 10 days later in what was then St. Nicholas, St. Nicholas's Church. The modern history of Pendower, of course, starts with the Pease of Pendower, who built Pendower, which we now think of as Pendower Hall, in 1867. John Pease was part of the Pease family that founded the railways and started some of the leading banks in Britain. Like many of the people who owned big houses in Benwell and the surrounding area, John was a Quaker. He was best friends with Thomas Hodgkin, who'd built Benwell Dean House in 1866. And Thomas and John had joined forces with two other bankers, Spence and Barnett, to form Hodgkin, Barnett, Pease and Spence, the bank, in 1859. In 1860, John Pease married Helen Maria Fox the daughter of a wealthy Quaker banker and a farmer from Cornwall. A year later, in 1861, Thomas Hodgkin married, married Helen Maria's younger sister, Lucy Ann, meaning Thomas and John were now connected by friendship, business and family. And this is how we come to have Pendower. A beautiful Cornish beach, close by Helen Maria's childhood home in Falmouth. When Pendower was complete in 1867, John and Maria moved in with their two children, Sarah and Howard, with Florence being born the same year and young John being born in the house in 1869, followed by his younger sister Sophia in 1871. This is what gives us the name of the estate and of course Pendower Way, but also Pease Avenue at the top of the estate. Pendower is made up of about 12 streets, but there are three that I haven't really been able to find very much information about. Lismore Avenue, Rushy Avenue, and Sunnybank Avenue. Sunnybank we know was originally called Tentop, but we can't find any more about why it became Sunnybank. So if you know, why not email in? Thanks for watching the film. I've really enjoyed making it, and I hope you enjoy the other parts of the big history event that are going on at the moment. Bye for now. Something in the way, something in the way.